climate change in the upper Midwest has impacted the livestock industry in many ways. One especially critical weather trend is the increasing frequency of heat waves. Anywhere in the state, we're warmer today than at any time in our measurement history. There's probably very few places in, on Earth that it gets as warm in the summer or as cold in the winter. Ultimately, heat stress can lead to losses in production. When it gets really hot, we get these 90, 95 degree days, high humidity, a couple days in a row, uh, and hot nights, uh, you hear about death loss. That's why animal cooling strategies are more important now than ever before. This video will demonstrate some fundamentals of cooling livestock animals on the farm. So that's variable one is our temperatures. Climatologist Mark Seely, seen here speaking at a swine workshop in southern Minnesota, warns of increasing heat waves driven by higher humidity. Uh, variable two is the water vapor in the air around us. The uh, quantity of water vapor in the air around us has been going up. A look back at historical heat waves in Minnesota shows that most since the 1950s have been driven by dew point, indicated by the blue lines, while in previous decades, most heat waves were driven by temperature or a combination of dew point and temperature, indicated by the red lines and the orange lines. We've been getting uh, dew points that are roughly equivalent to the, what they get in the Persian Gulf in the Middle East. And when we get these and we couple these with a summertime temperature of 85 or 90 degrees, it then gives us a thermal heat index of 105 or 115 or 120. In addition, nighttime low temperatures are not as low as they were in the past, which makes it difficult for animals to recover from daytime heat stress. Our nighttime minimum temperatures are warming at twice the rate of our daytime maximum temperatures. This increase in heat events coincides with improvements in animal genetics, nutrition, and productivity which means the animals are generating more metabolic heat. They have to dissipate this extra heat, and the result is they are more susceptible to heat stress, even when temperatures are lower. Birds and mammals are homeothermic, a term commonly known as warm-blooded. This means they maintain a stable core body temperature by adjusting to their surrounding environment. They maintain a balance between the metabolic heat produced by their bodies and the heat transferred by their bodies to the surrounding environment. The temperature conditions in which animals can easily maintain this balance is called their thermal neutral zone. This graph shows thermal neutral zones of various animals and stages of production. When temperatures drop below an animal's thermal neutral zone, the animal's metabolic rate increases to keep the body warmer. When temperatures rise above the animal's thermal neutral zone, we see adjustments in the animal's physiology and behavior to dissipate body heat and maintain a constant body temperature. These adjustments vary by species and include changes in respiration rates, sweating, panting, changes in activity and posture, and changes in food and water intake. I saw when she gets heat stress, she gets up 70, 75, 80 degrees. She's going to start increase her respiration rate. She's going to start to pant as a way to try to exchange more air, dissipate the heat through her lungs. Uh, she's going to become less active. She's going to lay out on her side more. Um, she's probably going to play with the water more, waste more water, those kind of things. Things to do to try to keep herself cool. There are four fundamental ways in which animals can transfer heat from their bodies to their surrounding environment. They are conduction, convection, radiation, and evaporation. Conductive heat loss happens when skin comes in contact with a colder surface. An example is when pigs cool themselves by lying on cool concrete. Convective heat loss happens when heat is carried away from the body by the flow of air or water. 
Any time there is a temperature difference between an animal and cooler surrounding air, the animal will lose heat to the air. This convective heat transfer can be enhanced by increased airflow. Think of the additional cooling one gets by standing in front of a fan. This is less effective for animals with hair or feathers because of the extra layer creating a boundary between the animal's skin and the airflow. With radiative heat loss, heat is transmitted by electromagnetic energy between two surfaces that are not in direct contact with each other, but have a clear line of sight from one to the other. For example, animals or humans feel heat loss when standing near a cold window, even if the room temperature is warm. In contrast, animals and humans can gain heat by standing in the sun or by a warm wall. Finally, evaporative heat loss is when a liquid, typically sweat or water, evaporates, changing from a liquid to vapor. This happens when an animal breathes heavily or pants. Evaporative cooling works best when humidity is lower and when there is a large difference in temperature between the animal and the ambient air. Farmers can use all four of these heat transfer methods to keep their animals cool. First, we'll look at some of the more common and cost-effective cooling methods. Providing shade is one way to cool animals out on pasture or on open lots. Shade does not reduce the ambient temperature, but it does reduce the radiant heat gain from the sun. Adequate ventilation in livestock buildings is critical for keeping animals cool. An effective ventilation system will keep the temperature inside the barn stable at just a few degrees above the outside ambient temperatures, within 1 or 2 degrees Celsius or 3 to 5 degrees Fahrenheit. The amount of ventilation needed in the barn depends on the number, type, and size of the animals. The ventilation rate is measured in cubic feet per minute, or CFM. This graph shows that the amount of CFM needed in hot weather varies greatly depending on the type of animal, phase of production, and weight of the animal. For example, a sow and litter require a high ventilation rate of 500 CFM, while a 5-pound broiler chicken requires a ventilation rate of only 2 CFM. Another commonly used method to cool animals is to increase the air velocity or air speed moving past them. This helps increase both convective and evaporative cooling. Usually air speeds between 300 and 600 feet per minute are recommended. Increasing air speed any higher than that will not improve the cooling enough to justify the extra costs of additional fans and energy used. The methods for increasing air speed depend on where the animals are housed. In naturally ventilated barns or on open lots, circulation fans can create these air speeds. In tunnel ventilated barns, increasing the ventilation rate will increase the air speeds. In cross ventilated barns, baffles are used to restrict the airflow path, which increases the speed of air flowing at the animal's level. Unfortunately, airspeed becomes less effective as a cooling method as ambient temperatures get hotter, as these two graphs show. In the first graph, the ambient temperature outside the swine barn is cooler, 41 degrees Fahrenheit. As the airspeed increases from 100 to 200 to 300 feet per minute and higher, there is a dramatic decrease in the effective environmental temperature, or EET. The EET is a more accurate measurement of the temperature felt by the animals because it takes into account several factors, including humidity and airspeed. In this case, the animals feel a decrease in the EET due to the increased convection. The cooling effect is more dramatic for smaller 44-pound animals than for bigger 220-pound animals because of the smaller animal's ratio of surface area to body mass. In the second scenario, we have a much higher ambient temperature of 95 degrees Fahrenheit. As the graph shows, increasing the airspeed from 0 to nearly 400 feet per minute has a very minimal effect on the effective environmental temperature. The effect is minimal regardless of the size and weight of the animals. Another commonly used cooling method used for swine, beef, and dairy is direct sprinkling. 
Direct sprinkling enhances evaporation by adding an extra moisture layer that acts like sweat, which removes body heat when the water evaporates from the animal's skin. This method works best in less humid conditions. It's also more effective when combined with increased airspeed over the animals. Sprinklers can be set up on a timer to go on and off in intervals. The dry intervals should allow enough time for evaporation to occur before the next sprinkling interval starts again. This saves water and enhances evaporative cooling. These intervals can be set to change with the ambient temperatures. Other methods to increase evaporative cooling include fine misting systems or evaporative cooling pads. In both cases, evaporating water removes heat from the air, which lowers the temperature in the barn. This diagram shows how an evaporative cooling pad system works. A fan draws hot, dry air through a water-soaked pad. As the air flows through the moist pad, the water evaporates, taking heat out of the incoming air. Evaporative cooling is more effective in drier climates, where it can reduce temperatures by 10 to 20 degrees Fahrenheit. In more humid climates, the temperature drops are closer to 5 to 10 degrees Fahrenheit. For example, in this table you'll see that, with an ambient temperature of 90 degrees Fahrenheit and a relative humidity of 55%, evaporative cooling can only lower the temperature to about 81 degrees. This is still above the thermoneutral zone of most animals. The cooling systems we've just discussed are the most commonly used, but there are new alternative systems being explored. At this point, most of these systems are typically not cost-effective because the gains in animal performance are not enough to offset the cost to install and operate the systems. However, some are producing results that show they may become more cost-effective in the future. So this is a geothermal cooled dough finishing room. Geothermal cooling systems are used to cool the inlet air coming into the barn. In these systems, a water glycol mixture is circulated through a looped piping system in the ground, where the temperature is stable year-round at about 50 degrees Fahrenheit. These ground loops can be vertical, going as deep as 300 feet down into the ground, or they can be installed horizontally at around 15 feet deep. These go down about 230 feet into the ground and come back up. So essentially once you get down to 10, 15 feet, uh, the thermal, the geothermal temp, the, the temperature at that level is right around 50 degrees Fahrenheit. The cooled fluid is pumped into a heat exchanger coil that is positioned in front of the inlet airstream. All the outside air is drawn in through this large essentially radiator heat exchanger and the cooled uh, uh, fluid that goes down into the wells are inside these pipes and as the air comes through it cools off. The number of loops or wells in the system is based on the amount of cooling needed. At the sow farm in western Minnesota, the geothermal system uses one well for every three pigs on the gestation farrowing site. About 60 degrees is the temperature of the air that's coming in. These geothermal systems are not only used to cool the warm inlet air during the summer, they can also be used to warm the cold inlet air during the winter. This is because the water coming into the heat exchanger from the ground is at a constant temperature of about 50 degrees Fahrenheit year-round. We can show that there is actually airflow. The costs of installing a geothermal system may be offset by the lower cost of operating the ventilation system or by the reduced need for supplemental heat in cold weather. The costs may also be offset by improved animal performance if heat stress is reduced. I can see the, uh, these gaining some traction, especially for some selected parts of, of production units. I think the cost of these will, will go down, but but it is an expensive option, and uh, I think we would be looking at paybacks that would be, you know, 15, 20, 30 years or something. Air conditioning is a cooling method that is popular for spaces occupied by humans. 
But the economics of AC still do not make sense for standard animal production systems because of the need to remove moisture and hazardous gases from the barn. While residential systems recirculate cooled air, animal ventilation systems typically use cooled air only once before it is exhausted in order to remove the moisture and gases. This makes the system much less efficient. Air conditioning has been installed in barns with high-value animals, such as swine boar studs or purebred dairy cows, but in general is not cost-effective. Radiant cooling is used in human-occupied buildings, where ceiling beams or walls are cooled in a way that is similar to in-floor heating. The cooler surfaces remove heat from the occupants. This same technology could be used in animal buildings. Finally, floor conduction is an effective cooling method that shows potential for swine breeding facilities and dairy operations. Animals instinctively lie down on cool surfaces when they're hot. There are challenges with conductive cooling. Condensation on the cooled surface could promote disease or create a slippery surface for the animals. In swine buildings, the challenge is integrating the floor cooling with the use of slatted floors and deep pitted manure storage. One proposed solution is to use partially slatted floors in the barns with the cooling integrated into the solid portion of the floor. Farmers who are considering an investment in cooling need to determine their priorities, which part of the barn or operation, and which animals need cooling the most. Can the common, conventional, cost-effective practices used now provide enough cooling for more productive animals who experience heat stress at lower temperatures and are more affected by higher humidity levels? Farmers of the future will likely need to invest in new cooling systems to allow the animals of the future to reach their genetic potential as temperatures and humidity levels increase. The challenge, I think, in this whole area is coming up with systems, um, mechanical systems or whatever, that are cost-effective and dependable. Understanding thermoneutral zones, the impacts of heat stress on animals, and the options for efficient and cost-effective cooling are more critical now than ever before. By reducing heat stress, farmers can maintain the health and comfort of their animals and, in turn, reap the rewards of their investment with higher productivity and profits.